G'day, SA. I'm Jenna. And I'm Jay. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Parafield. Today, Jenna, I'm very excited because we are standing in my old stomping oh, ground. Oh, wow. And today we're going to go to the classic Jets War Museum. And I tell you what, Jay, I have a surprise for you as well. Nobody told me about a surprise. We are going to go check out the Adelaide Warbirds and you are getting in one of the planes. Nobody told me about that. Cannot wait. Parafield Airport is just 20 minutes from the Adelaide CBD. And according to Aircraft Movement, it's the fifth busiest airport in the country. It's used for flying training and recreational flying and aircraft maintenance. But it also hosts a jet fighter museum and historic aircraft displays. The Classic Jets Fighter Museum started in 1993 in an old shed in Salisbury. After gaining interest from the public, it warranted a bigger space to showcase the meticulous work of its dedicated volunteers. Here with Bob from the Classic Jet Fighter Museum. I'm very excited to be in here and there's so many amazing things to see in here. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> now, how long have you been director here? About 16, 18 years. 16, 18 years. Yeah, there's about uh, 40 volunteers uh, based. They're all hands on. There's no one, just some wanders in and out. They're all doing, working on planes, maintaining all the aircraft in the display hangar here and uh, all hands on people. So what's your fascination with aviation? You, you, you were telling me about 30 years in the industry. Oh, not in the industry, I've just been a volunteer. I mean, I've retired, but I mean, I work so hard. But uh, you know, it's mainly just going from one hobby, building old cars, and went over to aeroplanes, which maybe shouldn't have done. <laughs> you shouldn't have, because it's become a massive hobby. It's a big thing, yeah. Now, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about this lightning plane that's standing behind us? The P-38, this is a really rare ship. Um, it first landed in Papua New Guinea, um, about 43. Um, it landed on its belly because it couldn't lock down its undercarriage, it landed wow. on its belly, skidded to a stop. The pilot was fine. Uh, because it was a, uh, one of the last aircraft of this particular type, they lifted it and stripped it for spare parts and abandoned it during the war. And then uh, after many years, uh, some hauled out in a helicopter and uh, was seized by the New Guinea government. We did a deal, got the wreck and uh, spent seven years completely rebuilding it. So some of the things to see in here is obviously a lot of jet fighter planes. How many have you got in this hangar? Well, we've only got the three jets in here and one next door. We, 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 we quit two of them because we ran out of room and uh, we just couldn't afford to leave them outside. They were starting to deteriorate. So we sold them off and we had to make room for the chipmunk over here and the Nanchangs, which are joy flying aircraft. And uh, so we're down to three jets now and, and uh, four fighter aircraft. There's a Tiger Moth, there's a Mustang next door and a Boomerang and stuff like that as well. Now the lightning plane behind us, absolutely beautiful. I noticed there's a name Laura on the side of the plane. Can you just tell us a little about who Laura is? Laura? Well, we don't know. You don't know who Laura is? No, she's an elderly lady that visited here many years ago and she liked what she saw and every year she sends a couple of thousand dollars over just to uh, help the projects move along. That is absolutely beautiful. We don't even know her, we can't even acknowledge her. Yeah. She doesn't want to be known. Uh, it's amazing. So. Well, we're, we're, we're proud of Laura. That's a beautiful story. Now, if you were to put this in the sky, you were telling me it would cost about $4 million yeah, to get it up and running. Could be, yeah. It could approach $4 million. Somewhere between 3 and $4 million. That's crazy, isn't it, really? Well, it's a rich man's game, but these rich. don't fly, I hasten to add. No, no. <laughs> uh, what's some other activities you can do in the museum while you're here? What else can you get your hands on? Well, we've got uh, the, three, the three jet aircraft we allow people to sit in. Uh, which is not done anywhere in Australia. And, uh, and I'm hanging to do that in a minute, <laughs> just quietly. Uh, we'll, we'll get you in the Mirage. Beautiful. Uh, but uh, yeah, people sitting out uh, in the planes, we have school children coming through on tours and uh, they learn a lot. Nowadays, of course, with airports, you can't even touch an airplane, no, you can't go near no. it. Since September 11, it's mm. all sort of really... But now you can go up and you can touch it and it's safe to touch. I mean, the aircraft that fly, they're behind ropes, obviously, they can't be touched. But uh, they can sit in the jets, they can climb on the wing of the cobra and sit in the sabre and, and uh, the young people reckon it's really, really good, you know, learning about planes up close instead of just picture books and movies, I guess. Now, Bob, let's check out some more classic fighter jets. I like the look of that one over there. Let's go and have a look. A little cobra? Let's go. Ooh. 
Now, Bob, I'll tell you what, this one caught my eye, the Cobra, as we were walking in. Can you just tell us a little bit about the Cobra? The Cobra, this is a very unique aircraft. It's a mid-engined. Uh, all aircraft have their engines in the front, behind the propeller, but these have the engine behind on the wing with a drive shaft through the front, which left room for all the armour in the nose of the plane, a couple of 50 cows and a cannon. Very good idea, uh, but not particularly successful it was designed in 1936, 37 and was used early in the Pacific War and not particularly successfully but they were there in numbers when they were needed until the more modern planes like the 38 came along. So World War II we would have seen this plane fighting for the uh, US? Essentially yeah, we, we had them uh, they had them up in Papua New Guinea yep. uh, and we had air croppers, uh, this one here, uh, in defence of Sydney straight after the Japanese submarines went in there and they, they flew a lot of these down and we didn't have any aircraft. So they gave us about a dozen of these and we pranked half of them but, yeah. and gave the rest back. Do you know what I find like you walk up and you have a look and you've seen a lot of movies, we've seen Pearl Harbor, we've seen all these uh, sort of movies and you can actually just feel it in just in your stomach. You can see the uh, uh, weaponry up there and you, oh, it just sort of, you just would not want to be on the receiving end. Oh, well you wouldn't know much would you? No. <laughs> No, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very, uh, very powerful engine and uh, a very uh, well-armed plane, but uh, they were only good at low altitudes. That was their problem, they weren't supercharged, and uh, that was their drawback. Couldn't get high, because all the Japanese planes, like the Spitfire, could get high. Yeah. But these couldn't. So we're going to kiss this Cobra, and uh, only because I took my eye when we walked in, and let's have a look at some of the others we've got here in the Jet Fighter Museum. Okay. One of only two aviation museums in South Australia, the museum occupies a whole hangar and takes up half of the adjoining hangar for its restoration works. Over the years, seven fighter aircraft have been restored to museum display condition, which isn't an easy accomplishment. Bob, I'm in front of the Corsair. It's one of the uh, projects that you've got here for the last three years. Can you just tell us a little bit about the Corsair? Corsair. We salvaged that from Vanuatu, it was off the north coast of Aparte, landed in I think about 42, just off the coast, ran out of fuel after a training flight, a pilot just stepped out and waded ashore. Uh, the guns were taken out and it was just abandoned and it just rotted away and uh, anyway, eventually we we found out about it, did a deal with the landowner and uh, we got permission from the Vanuatu government to export it and uh, restore it. Now your restoration uh, generally takes about six years, so you've got another three years to go? Yeah, but we're not in a hurry, there's no deadline. No hurry? No, 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 just work through the plane. Now there was only 10,000 of these planes ever made, uh, what number was this one? You were telling me it was probably one of the oldest ones still going around? Yeah, I believe it was number 124 off the assembly line. It's an early model birdcage and um, it's, it's pretty rare. Now I know restorations at home can often take a long time. How do you know where to start with the restoration of the plane? Well, we, we salvaged the wreck. Uh, that took quite some time. It was in about uh, two metres of water. Uh, we had to break it up in the water at low tide and uh, take it a float it ashore with, uh, with uh, plastic bottle, bottles and bags and all sort of stuff and a bit of a dinghy affair. Um, we can, cleaned it, it was full of weeds and seaweed and, and shells and stuff, all had to be cleaned before it comes into Australia. So we left it out in the weather and it, uh, it all rotted away and it, it fell off and it was rain on every day and sunshine as well and anyway the, the wreck came back fairly clean. Uh, that supplied a lot of uh, knowledge and as far as building the airframe itself, we were very fortunate because we got a loan of a lot of large components, wing sections that we had a loan of for uh, uh, several months, we made them uh, jigs made them fit the jigs, new jigs we made, and we took them back, gave them, out, gave them back and uh, built our own wing sections. So we had many parts that we could actually replicate in good condition. You know. So how many uh, people have you got working on the restoration? Uh, there's about 30 on the plane. 30? Comes and goes, yeah, they're all hands-on guys, there's no, uh, you know, no one sitting around, they, they come here to work. A few chaps on Sunlink and unemployment benefits, they're mostly volunteers. Now this is a uh, spare part from Corsair. Now this is the spar for the fuel tank, is that correct? This is the main spar. This is, this is the, the spine or the backbone of the wing. Uh, and the engine bearer bolts on the front here. There's one whole bolt goes through there and the engine bearer goes on the front. Engine goes on the front of that. So this is a very straight, a strong section of the aircraft. Uh, behind us the fuel tank bay. And then behind that you've got your cockpit. And your wing is either side of that. Where we're sitting is roughly where the air, uh, oil coolers are. So uh, it's the strongest, strongest part of the plane. So what work have we got to do with this one at the moment to get this restored? We can't 
restore this, it's it's rotten. It's corroded. Totally it's gone. Beyond, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll replicate the pipes. We've replicated all these engine bearers. There's all sorts of stuff, and it's a reference, mainly a reference, um, so you can understand what the plane is made of. We've got the wings next door. We've copied those, replicated those. They're in storage. They're all corroded the same way. But, but we are touching 1943 material right here, oh, though. So oh, you yeah. know, it's been around this for a while. This is the real thing, mate. The real deal. Yeah, this only done. This airplane was uh, only done one mission. That's all it ever did. Before it, went, it got it, dug out of the water. Well, it, it took off uh, uh, escorting a fleet of light bombers on a training exercise up towards Guadalcanal. They all got lost and, uh, and, it, and it landed in the water when it came back. And it was a single flight, only did one flight. Wow, all that money just for one flight. Just for one two hour flight. The Classic Jets Fighter Museum is open seven days a week, 10 till four. It's well worth checking out. And if you're looking for a rewarding hobby, why not sign up as a volunteer? Now, Bob, I'm really excited because this year it's a biannual event. Can you tell everybody what's happening in March? Yeah, March 17, we're having our ninth uh, fly-in and air display. There'll be about 30 aircraft lined up on the eastern tarmac. Uh, a lot of people have been here before, thousands have seen it. Uh, it'll be much the same. Uh, there'll be uh, wind jewels, boomerangs, uh, T6 Texans, 20, 28s, uh, possibly even a jet. Some wow. Of a training jet coming in if we can get it right. So it'll be a full-on day, we'll be flying from 10 o'clock to finish about 4, non-stop. That's crazy because that, that is in its 18th year this year. And I remember coming as a child with my father because I'm a local boy. Mm. And uh, it's beautifully all over the tarmac and it's a great experience for the day. Yeah, people love it. It's really a family show, really. And they just wander up and down. We've got side shows and catering and vehicles on display and motorbikes and military vehicles, the usual thing. And all our planes will be out on a tarmac. All five of them will be lined up, including the Mustang on display which is near where they at the moment. And uh, as I said, kids, kids can sit in the jets out there and uh, see what it's like outside. Now we've had a good look at the planes, let's see how they fly. Today, I'm going to be flying one of the Nanchang CJ-6A Chinese fighter aircraft. These aircraft were first developed in the 1950s and the same design is used today. To me that just tells me one thing, they got the design right. The aircraft goes about 360 km per hour and reaches a g-force of 6.5. This will be the ultimate test for me, I can't wait. Getting everything checked before the flight is essential, even the smallest things can make a difference. These old aircraft, um, they are actually fairly, fairly reliable. We have um, all the maintenance we need here on the airport at Parafield. So just basically checking, checking the plane over at the moment. Um, we can see all the control linkages, all the electronics um, through these hatches. Also, we're always looking for any bends and things in the fuselage or the um, structure which might not have become available. And just checking here, we can see a little bit of the inside structure of the wing and the control surface linkage. So. so the aircraft are now ready to fly. All we need to do now is some safety briefing. So two aircraft out of run there. BRY, Stephen Albion, you'll be in MNJ, which will be with Ash and yourself. As the briefing went on, I was getting more and more nervous about the flight. We're going to go straight into our batting sequence, probably starting off with a barrel roll, a loop, a stall turn, oh, yeah. and um, a half given or something on the end. So we'll be heading up to about three and a half to four Gs. At the end, I only had one question. Uh, do you have a toilet? So I was off. Meanwhile, Jen decided to see if I was in some safe hands. So before we let Jay go up into the planes, I thought we'd better have a chat with one of the pilots and find out just exactly what they will be doing. So I'm here with Angus, and Angus, tell us, how long have you been flying these planes for? These planes for about two years now. Okay, but in terms of a pilot, your experience? Oh, I've been flying since I was 14, so wow. way over, way over 10 years. So now. you're very qualified, all right. Long time. Yep. Check, now tell us about um, the plane and and what kind of plane it is and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so we've got two of them. They're identical CJ-6 Nanchangs, uh, ex-military uh, trainers and ground attack aircraft. Mm -hmm. So we've got obviously 
backward and front cockpit for the real military experience and it looks like this model here um, some interesting uh, systems we've got the big radial engine up front so um, when we jump in with Jay, the sound's going to be absolutely fantastic. Wow. And you hear the air rushing around and things, so it's really cool. All right, well, I suppose with all of the video games and PlayStation games and all that sort of stuff, it really is a kid's dream to get behind this and have a flight, or at least go into one. Is yeah. that how it started off for you? Um, it started off for me, the flying, flying dream, really from traveling from a very young age. And um, this kind of flying just really appealed to me because I did my training here at Powerfield mm -hmm. and just sim go past of course you play on your flight simulator like you said your games and like that but when you're actually there and moving a real airplane yeah. and you can feel you can not not only can you see it moving you can feel it as well you know you're, you're four times your body weight coming out of a loop you go to put your hand up to flick a switch or talk to air traffic and yeah it's like you've got a 20 kilo dumbbell <laughs> strapped to your hand really so yeah that's what jay's got to look forward to so you do a bit of a workout while you're in there oh massively <laughs> massively and um when when we come back from the flight if you um talk to Jay or anyone, Stevie, who's my mate, who's coming flying with me, you really get a, get quite sweaty because every time you pull those Gs, you constrict all the muscles in your core, your, your abs, your chest, just to try and stop that blood flowing away from your um, That's very interesting. head and blacking out. All right. And tell us about the route you're going to do because obviously you're going to do some pretty crazy tricks up there. You're going to make our boys scream. So talk us through the routine. So mm -hmm. we're going to be departing here from Parafield. Tracking out to St Kilda and climbing up above the beaches um, of Adelaide. That's all going to be in formation with the two aircraft okay. moving around a bit. And the actual aerobatic routine, we're going to start off quite easily with something called a barrel roll. Mm -hmm. where we just roll up over the top like this. Wait, so let me get this straight. Upside down. Upside down. Okay. Completely. You look up, but you're looking down. <laughs> that's just crazy. I love the look on people's faces when we say, yeah, you're going to be looking up, <laughs> but that's not going to be the sky. Wow. Um, and basically progressing from there, so more extreme maneuvers. So the next one we're going to see is a loop, which is 360 degrees of pitch, mm -hmm. upside down again, a bit lighter at the top, back round and through. Okay. And then if he's feeling really game, we're going to put him put him into a hammerhead, or what's known as a stall turn, where we come straight up into the vertical, and we use the rudder on the back here. Okay. Just as the airplane comes to a stop, we put it around our wingtip and come back down. So right at the top of there, you're completely weightless and. Yeah, it's quite an interesting sensation. A lot of people go like this <laughs> to try and hold on to something at the top of that. Is it sort of like, you know, sometimes when you drive in a car and you sort of reach a hill and then you drop down and you sort of lose your stomach a little bit? Do you have any moments like that up there when you sort of feel Definitely, definitely. Plenty? All of the weightlessness, also some of the negative G coming over the top, things like that. Yeah, plenty of that. But it it's all, all depends on, you know, how the pilot works to control. So to the, towards the beginning, definitely not. We want to get people yep. used to it. Towards the end, yeah, you really give it to if them. They're, if they're really, if they're really enjoying it in the back, they're saying go, go, go. Then, yep, yeah, we'll we'll show them what a plane can do. And I'm sure it would be very exciting for you as a pilot to give people this brand new experience to really see the emotions change from being scared at the beginning to being absolutely loving it at the end. That must be so exciting for you. Oh, definitely. That, that that's a massive, massive thing about it, and that's what makes this flying so unique. You know, it's it's not like Qantas or Virgin, anyone like that. If the guy in the back's whooping around, hollering, having a good time. He's not had too many to drink or anything like that. He's just, he's you just have to show them it. their exit signs. <laughs> <laughs> no, we give them a full safety brief, show them how to get yep. out. But you know, they, they, they're just, it's all about, it's all about enjoyment. It's all about their experience and pushing what they think they can do. And so I'm sure he will want to go again once he finishes off. It's a bit infectious, oh. I'd say. I reckon he'll be ready for round two. I reckon he'll be asking us when we've got plane number three, so we can do a three ship formation. <laughs> well, there you go. I think he's in pretty good hands.
So you feed it back on land, Jay. How do you feel? Oh, I feel great. It was an absolutely amazing experience. I thought I was nervous, but when we were up there, we were all right. And then all of a sudden, we went into these rolls and felt the uh, G-force pretty crazy, and I could feel it in the old stomach. I mean, I think we could almost hear your scream <laughs> from <laughs> I down think here. Could. What? Uh, tell us at what moment did you really lose it? Uh, the very first drop that we did. Okay, so talk us through the drop. Uh, we just built up, went up, and then went right over. And then when I could just see the water I'm looking over the top of my head, oh my God, that was just crazy. Crazy? And I'll, did you let a, a few screams? Uh, I'll say no, but I'm sure he will say, yeah, I'd let, let a couple go. And, and tell us how, how you felt. I felt great. Um, I'm just still shaking. I don't know what to say to yeah, you, Jeff. The adrenaline, <laughs> the adrenaline, adrenaline is really still here. In. It's crazy. Do you get to live that in a child? I didn't think I'd ever do that because living up the road, just around the corner, I'd always see it and I didn't You'd think I'd have You'd always hear it. the planes and everything. And then, yeah, to have a go at it was amazing. Well, I guess the, the question that's on everyone's lips is would you do it again? I would do it again for sure. You would? I would definitely do it again. So that was one of my childhood dreams that come true. Now, I'm really interested to know how it all started. Let's go and find out. I'm here with Ashley, who's one of the owners of Adelaide Warbirds. Thank you so much for having us here, Ashley. Now, tell us how you started off the business? Oh, I guess, you know, we owned one of the Nanchangs um, back in 2006. We were leasing it down to, at that stage, a business in Goolwa. Mm -hmm. um, and then we decided, well, let's have a piece of the action as well. And we started our own business back in October 2006. Must be a pretty fun job. Yeah, well, it's good. I mean, it's a, it's a hobby business, I guess, as such. You know, there's, we have enough work to keep us going on weekends. Mm -hmm. um, it's not it's definitely not a, a full-time job, but it's good to keep it that way too, because you turn a hobby into a business and uh, it's not quite so enjoyable anymore. So. And let's talk about the planes, yep. um, where they come from and what their history is. So these are Chinese aircraft, um, which, you know, when you say that to people, you get a few reactions, but... Made in China. <laughs> <laughs> right. Everything's made in China, but no, they're, they're actually very rugged and, and uh, reliable aircraft. And these, they're a warbird of choice, I guess, around the world for this sort of thing now. Okay. Um, there's close to 40 of them in Australia now. Right. Yep. And uh, we get all our, our spares generally from the USA because there's a pretty big following of these aircraft in the US as well. Okay, so how old are these planes? These are both mid-60s. And you've got two? You've got two. So these are mid-60s. Mm -hmm. This design was built um, first in the 50s mm -hmm. and they still build them new today. Very re very reliable aircraft. The Chinese The same design still, yep, still same to today. So you know they've made it right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> They're not built for the civilian market. They're built for the military market. Okay. So, and how long have you been flying for? Um, I started flying well, 13 years ago now, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I had, I've got a commercial licence and at one stage, yeah, I was flying full time, I had a, another uh, charter business, mm -hmm. um, but for most of that 13 years I've been flying part time and working as an engineer full time. So. so what a great way for people to come and get in one of the planes and be part of a flight for say if you're interested in perhaps learning to become a, a pilot. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's it's great taking people who who are interested in aviation. Yeah. You know, kids who go and buy toy airplanes and things like that, and, and, and you take them up in an the aircraft. And we've had a few people who uh, you know, have ended up, you know, so well, we want to join the air force and see what it's like. And, wow. You know, you know, a few people after their flight, they'll, they'll say I want to get my pilot's license. But no, it's a good thing. I think uh, you know this is one of the few experiences like this in Adelaide. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been running for a while now, so we're starting to become a, a bit better known. Well but, known. But, but yeah, I think you know there aren't that many people doing this sort of thing. So you know, we're doing our bit to try and keep aviation at the forefront of people's minds, I guess. Fantastic. Now you have a family. Have yep. you? Has your family got up there? <laughs> yep. Yeah, we used to have a with the charter business a big ten seat aircraft with two engines, which was also a vintage aircraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've flown the family um, to the east coast and to Brisbane a few times in that. Fantastic. So, yeah, it's a, they, they'll be in airplanes. So they trust you, so we can trust you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, if, if, uh, if as I said you know, before, if, if the pilot's throwing his hands in the air and, and screaming, the passenger's got something to worry about. So <laughs> that didn't happen that time up. But And look, it's an experience to come in here just to have a talk with you guys because yeah. you know your staff and obviously you know your aircraft really well. If you look around the place, obviously you, you, you just really live and breathe flying, don't you? Oh, well, <laughs> we, we try. I mean, you know, no... Any pilot who says he knows everything is dangerous. I think so. You know, we we um, we know a bit, and we we you know, we basically do everything we do based on procedures and, and checklists and uh, minimise risk like that. But mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, we definitely like what we do, and people like Angus you know, keep the business going. So through his enthusiasm. <laughs>
Now I'm sad, Jen, because the show's about to finish, but I tell you, I've had an amazing experience mm. on this bad boy in the skies. Did you ever? I'm very jealous. My belly's a little bit queasy, but if you want to do the same, why not come down here on the weekend? These guys are a wealth of knowledge and a bag of laughs as well. And if you love travel as much as we do, then why don't you share your travel pictures with us on our Facebook page? And I'll tell you what, Jen, I reckon this will be a great opportunity for Photo of the Week. What do you reckon? Let's do it. Cheese. Cheese.